A look at the new Ecuadorian chocolate shop in Five Points. A sneak peek at the new science labs. And CCHS's thoughts on Valentine's Day. All in this episode of ODTV. Nick and Peter Dale opened Condor Chocolates in Five Points on December 20th, 2014. The shop produces chocolate directly from the bean and focuses on preserving the unique flavors. ODTV reporter Carla Dugan visited the shop in order to bring Ecuadorian culture to Clark Central. The two things that greet patrons upon entrance to Condor Chocolate located at 1675 South Lumpkin Street are the art that lines the walls and the smell of fresh chocolate being ground, brewed, melted, or formed. Uh, a couple years ago, when I was in Ecuador, I wanted to bring back chocolate as gifts for friends here. And found that down there, there wasn't like a nicely packaged and uh, more artisanal chocolate being produced. Everything was for being exported to like Hershey's and um, big companies um, and not, not something smaller that was um, highlighting the unique qualities of Ecuadorian chocolate. After this trip, Peter teamed up with his brother Nick in order to start Condor, which opened up on December 20th, 2014, a business that focuses solely on Ecuadorian chocolate. Our mom is originally from Ecuador, and Ecuador produces um, the most cacao of any country in the Americas. And so we grew up eating chocolate in Ecuador and really loving like, the flavor profile of Ecuadorian chocolate. Condor is considered a bean-to-bar business. They take raw cacao bean and manufacture it directly into the bar form. As far as we know, there's only one other bean to bar producer in Georgia. Um, there's one in Atlanta. Um, and uh, so, so it's a pretty new um, segment. There's a lot of chocolate shops, but not many people who are, who are starting from the wrong. Condor boasts a large variety of products, from traditional bars to chocolate with cayenne and typical Ecuadorian style to sipping chocolate. I had a couple of samples at a party, uh, some salad, caramel. The experience of both of the Dale brothers has contributed to the final product of Condor. While Peter brings the knowledge of business, Nick brings with him the experience of understanding how to make chocolate and operate the machinery used in the process of chocolate making. Um, I've been making chocolate for almost three years now. Uh, I call myself, I am a, a self-taught chocolate maker. So, um, it's, there's a lot of resources online, different forums, I've talked to different people, but it's been a, kind of a, like I said, just figuring out the kitchen at first. The atmosphere of Condor was very important to the Dale brothers, as they wanted Condor to be more than just a place that customers rush in and out of. And yeah, so we want people to, to, you know, you can come in and buy a box of chocolates to give us a gift, or you can come and hang out and watch what's going on, or visit with friends. The Dale brothers opened at the height of the holiday season and firmly introduced themselves into the Athens culinary scene. After having successfully gotten Condor off the ground, they are actively looking toward the future. Um, so our goal is to produce um, enough that we can sell them outside of the store, so on our website and also in other specialty food shops and, and gift shops. Um, so that, that's definitely my goal is to um, be producing enough for our store, but then also enough that we can sell beyond Athens um, and sort of spread that message about Ecuadorian chocolate. The 2015 Clark Central soccer season kicked off with its two week-long tryouts. ODTV reporter Trent Slutsky talked to soccer head coach Chris Aiken about his thoughts on the upcoming season. Beginning on January 12th, 10-day tryouts for the spring 2015 Clark Central High School boys soccer teams took place. 65 students attended tryouts to compete for spots on the two teams. Varsity boys head coach Chris Aiken says that he is excited for the coming season. So tryouts is a, it's a 10 day period. The first five days is all conditioning. It's five days of running without the ball. And then once the ball tryouts start, it's primarily them playing small sided games. Uh, that way coaches can watch a few players playing at one time and it's easier to evaluate their skill level. 
Uh, if you play too many big games, uh, players can stand in the back and, and hide from the ball. But right. if you make it smaller, uh, there are a lot more uh, eyes can be on them at one time. Right. Aiken says that overall fitness alongside skill level is a key factor in deciding which team players will make. The beginning of tryouts, so the first day, is uh, just deciding who's going to be trying out for varsity and who's trying out for JV. Uh, this year, we had 65 players come out the first day. Uh -huh. So making sure that you put them on the right side of the field so that it's easier for you to identify them is a, is a big part of tryouts. And then what you do is you keep cycling players from the JV side of the field to the varsity side and just see how well the chemistry is with them and the varsity players. Okay. So all the returning players will go to one side of the field and then the best ones that I remember from JV the past season will come to the varsity side, and then we'll start bringing two or three over at a time each day just to see how well they work with the uh, returning varsity players. Aiken says that the team must have both peak personal fitness levels as well as a sense of camaraderie in order to be successful, and aims to foster these beliefs in his players. Uh, once you get your formations down and your fitness down, then it's more about building team chemistry, making sure that uh, all 20 players, whether you're in the game or on the bench, are all on the same mindset at all times. And uh, that's a difficult process that we'll develop this year, graduating 13 seniors last year, uh, making sure that you get 20 people to believe in the same thing is the, is the real struggle for the season. I think the thing that really gets them to bond, I know this will sound funny, is, uh, is actually running. Uh, we don't run outside, we always run in the old gym. We kind of have a set regimen of running, they know what it is now, I've been using it for three years. And uh, they really buy into it and really motivate each other, really encourage each other. Um, there's three groups of people working at one time and then one group that gets to rest. And usually you see that group that's resting, um, encouraging the other three groups, making sure everyone's positive. Right. If someone's struggling, everyone's there to pick them up. It's not, a, it's not a negative. It's not a, oh, you're slow. It's always about trying to improve and get better. Aiken says that he is pleased with the way he has seen his team interact this season and hopes that they will compete at a similar level the Gladiators did during the 2014 season. The goal for this year is, uh, I mean, it's never been to win the region. That's never our goal. It's always just to make the playoffs because mm -hmm. once you make the playoffs, anything can happen. Uh, four seeds can win the state championship all the time. So uh, it's all about winning enough region games to get in the playoff, and then once you're in there, anything can happen. Democrats in the South often face low voter turnout, resulting in lack of representation. In her recent vlog, Katie Mayfield analyzes voting patterns in the South and Democalypse debunked. Last November, in the throes of what many TV pundits now call Democalypse 2014, dozens of Democratic senators, governors, and representatives were beaten by their Republican opponents. To be fair, it is a Democratic president's second term, so this kind of thing isn't unusual. In compliance with the Democalypse, Democratic candidates for senator and governor, Michelle Nunn and Jason Carter, both lost to their Republican opponents. However, just because certain patterns normally appear in voting trends doesn't mean the election results are set in stone. Considering the polarizing attitudes many have towards the South's supposedly extremist conservative political values, neither Nunn nor Carter should have had a chance. Yet, they both did. Both candidates ran well-funded, well-publicized campaigns and lost by fewer than 10 points. Carter specifically lost to Deal by only 8 points, 53 to 45. I attended a fundraiser for Carter at Athens Grindhouse Killer Burgers, and the attitude wasn't one of cows to an electoral slaughter. Granted, the people I spoke to were bona fide Carter supporters. However, many of them also held offices in law or political science. They knew their stuff, and they decided to follow a candidate who knew his. Carter, a lawyer and state senator, and grandson of former President Jimmy Carter, has years of experience at the law firm Bondurant, Mixon, and Elmore, LLP, where he most notably challenged voter ID laws. In addition, Carter spent years working on education in South Africa through the Peace Corps, and still sits on the board of several charitable organizations and public interest groups, like Hands on Atlanta. Deal, on the other hand, has been involved in an ongoing ethics controversy involving multiple cover-ups of campaign finances. Basically, this election had a ninth generation Georgian and grandson of a president up against a governor with ethics issues. And yet Democrats, the party which already has trouble mobilizing voters, stayed at home on voting day, assuming that they could never win in our solid red state. What they don't consider is that Democrats' low voter efficacy is as big of an issue for Georgian Democrats as the Republican majority is. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and the New York Times, Georgia's demographics are changing significantly, and with them, so is our political culture. Minorities tend to vote heavily Democratic, and as a result, Georgia's growing minority populations should signal a less Republican-leaning state in the future. Georgian extremism is still prevalent simply because it's been prevalent for so long. 
According to the Red and Black, Athens Clark County, one of the most democratic counties in Georgia, had a voter turnout rate of 46.05%, whereas the overall state turnout for Georgia was 50.4%. Democratic candidates count on blue counties like Clark to come out in swarms in order to stand a chance. However, Clark County didn't come out this election, causing a sizable portion of the democratic vote to be lost. People often told me matter-of-factly after the election that I shouldn't have gotten my hopes up because no Democratic candidate could win in a state as red as Georgia. Maybe if they stopped thinking that way, one could. Whether it's a huge stuffed bear or just another day, everyone celebrates Valentine's Day in their own unique way. ODTV reporter Katie Sturdivant asked CCHS how they plan to celebrate the big day. What do you do for Valentine's Day? I usually just stay home a while. But there's a girl, I, I buy some flowers, some chocolate, take her out or something. Uh, I usually um, give my girlfriend something, uh, give, give my mom, uh, something for that, I give her some flowers and chocolates or something. Uh, at the last minute, when I'm getting off of work on the way home, I'll stop by Kroger and pick up whatever the cheapest flowers I can find. Probably get a gift, like, like some flowers or chocolate or something, and go to dinner somewhere nice. So what kind of treats you would get for Valentine's Day? Uh, I usually get uh, notes, cards, and chocolate. chocolate. Teddy bears, chocolates. <laughs> a little cheap little dollar chocolate. Nobody do <laughs> My mom used to get me stuff on Valentine's Day when I was a kid. She would get me like candy and stuff. Do you have a favorite memory of Valentine's Day? I was in elementary school. I was the only kid that brought chocolates to class and feel great. My chocolate, everybody about to make Valentine's cards. Now you know how you do it. Yeah, I school, just come bring cards. And stuff. I was on guy. I was on kid that brought chocolates to everybody like my gift. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I couldn't really afford to give the person on my date anything much. So I just baked them some cupcakes, and, um, but even still, they were still appreciative of that. Um, they took me on a really nice date, spent a lot of money on a gift that they really didn't have to because we were only dating for a little bit of time. Um, what do you think Valentine's is a big deal? Um, I don't really think it's that big a deal. I think it's more like a commercial holiday. You know, a lot of people get to give candy and food and things to each other. Uh, no, I don't think it's a big deal, but people spend a lot of money on it, so I guess it's a big deal. <laughs> okay. The new Science Wing, currently under construction in what was previously the West Wing, did not meet its deadline of December. ODTV reporter Rigel Turner talked to members of the department to get their take on the delay. Construction on the new Science Wing, on the first floor of the new building, has pushed past its original completion window of December. Work continues on the new wing and is expected to continue for the near future. Although the consequences from the delays will be minimal, the Odyssey spoke to Science Department head Scott Swain about the new wing. Um, and so we're looking at going as 21st century as possible. Even uh, okay. uh, microscopes, we're going to try to get top of the line there, uh, you know, for high school level. Right. You know? uh, and um, so, uh, yeah, we're looking to upgrade everything uh, as much as possible. Now, the, the building funds are not equipment funds, but there's some things that are equipment that's part of the building budget, if, if that makes sense. Yes. With the impact from the delays minimal, the science department's plans for the future have not changed. All in all, the project seems to be on the right track and will be completed by the end of the year. The technologies and capabilities that the new wing will offer to students are interesting enough to get Swain excited. Ah, well, we're very excited about it. Mm -hmm. I tell you, the school is, uh, you, I mean, it's designed pre-air conditioning, mm -hmm. and thus, you know, all the holes above the door. So right. we're just excited that, you know, kids will have a place they'll be proud of, walk mm -hmm. in and, and, you know, claim it as their own and, uh, you know, be able to just be proud of their facility. With Swain's excitement so obvious, we asked Clark Central students what they thought about the new science wing. Are you excited about the new science wing? Yeah, I'm really excited about the new science wing and the new equipment that's coming. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Are you excited about the new science wing? Yeah, I'm excited about the new building. This has been Rigel Turner with Odyssey Online. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of ODTV. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Odyssey News Mag and like us on Facebook. Additional content can be found at odysseynewsmagazine.net. This has been Ella Sams and Tiernan O'Neill for, for Odyssey, Odyssey Online. Online.